Welcome to another in our series of programs from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I'm pleased to be your host for this program. Our speaker tonight is a gentleman equally at home in Civil War history and World War II history. Let me introduce to you Jared Frederick. Jared is an instructor at Penn State University in Altoona. There he teaches American history, both Civil War and World War II, but he also teaches Pennsylvania history, military history, public history, cinematic history, cultural history, and has written books on American history in most of those subjects. He is the host of the YouTube series, Real History, looking at movies that depict American history. He's been a screenwriter on a movie that is coming out very soon. He is a frequent commentator on documentaries, and I particularly enjoyed seeing his hosting skills on Turner Classic Movies, where he talked about the movie Gettysburg. He is a former park ranger at both Gettysburg National Military Park and Harper's Ferry. He is a reenactor doing both Civil War and World War II. He's an artist and graphic designer. I think you will enjoy if you look up on his website seeing some of his artwork of various Civil War generals in particular. And he's the owner of History Matters Publications. Tonight he's going to be talking about this book. It's called Hang Tough, the World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters. This book was co-written by Jared with his friend Eric Dorr. Eric is the curator of the Gettysburg Museum of History, where he has multiple items from Dick Winters himself. So I'm going to turn the program over now to Jared Frederick to talk to us about the inside story of Major Dick Winters. Hello, everyone, and thank you once again for having me at the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Jared Frederick. I am an assistant teaching professor of history at Penn State Altoona, and this evening I would like to share with you some thoughts and observations of a book that, that I co-wrote with my fellow author, Eric Dorr, who is owner and curator of the Gettysburg Museum of History. The book is entitled Hang Tough, the World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters. Dick Winters is perhaps one of the more celebrated American officers of the Second World War, and at the heart of our book is his wartime correspondence which paints a very vivid picture of how he evolved as both a person and a leader through both heroism and very harrowing exploits in the course of that war. And to start us off, uh, since we are in Adams County, of course, I'd like to draw a comparison, one that I don't think is too far of a stretch. For all intents and purposes, I think many of us could consider Major Dick Winters to be the Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain of the Second World War. In so many ways, their experiences have parallels. Uh, both of them were born of a rather pacifist upbringing. Their mothers were very religious, instilled the hard work ethic in them. Both of them were very shy and timid during their upbringing. They were hesitant to uh, interact or socialize with fellow classmates. They were fearful of peer pressure, uh, but they ultimately overcame many of their youthful struggles because they were able to find solace in higher education. And ultimately, they put their educations and their careers on hold when the great challenges of their generations were put before them, uh, specifically the American Civil War and the Second World War. After they both achieved 
Battlefield Heroics, and Chamberlain receives the Medal of Honor. Winters was nominated for the Medal of Honor. Both of these individuals became uh, champions of their own stories as well as those of their men. Those stories, which both kept very detailed record of, were later noticed by subsequent historical writers. In the case of Joshua Chamberlain, Michael Shera writes The Killer Angels in the 1970s, and in the case with Winters, Stephen Ambrose pens the book Band of Brothers in the early 1990s. Both of those books are subsequently produced into wildly popular adaptations in which both men are the key protagonists of those productions. Uh, Thereafter, there is a process of commemoration and memorialization where both of these individuals end up becoming bronze statues. This speaks to the power, not only of Hollywood, but popular culture in general. Uh, But at the heart of the celebrity of these two individuals was their own efforts to keep detailed records of their own experiences, ones which thereafter became very much available to the masses. Uh, So I think that's a, a fairly healthy comparison to start us off with as we consider the exploits of Major Dick Winters. Much of our story is rooted in this building, which you can find on Baltimore Street in Gettysburg, and that is the Gettysburg Museum of History, as I said, owned and curated by my co-author, Eric Dorr. Eric Dorr and his family have a long history of collecting Gettysburg artifacts, and Eric's collection has grown to cover presidential history and history pertaining to the Second World War, especially that of Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division in the Second World War, which Dick Winters came to command. My co-author, Eric, was able to procure many of Dick Winters' artifacts uh, over the past several years. Those have gone on display in the museum as have many other Easy Company artifacts. Uh, And so if you are very much interested in historical relics, the story of the so-called Band of Brothers, uh, this is most definitely one place that you need to check out. And Gettysburg, as it turns out, is a very appropriate place to reflect upon World War II history. Not only is there a new World War II museum in the form of the World War II Experience Museum uh, located right outside of Gettysburg, but the community is also the sister community of San Mary Glees, another contested crossroads town, this one in Normandy. Of course, it was the post-war home of General Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, even lesser known is the fact that Dick Winters himself resided in the Gettysburg area immediately following the Second World War, starting his family in the vicinity of New Oxford, and Winters became involved in local governance to an extent, various civic programs and initiatives. It would seem that he was very much an active citizen of Adams County, and so there is very much a connection between this iconic leader and the broader history of Gettysburg. Much of our conversation, though, will be focused on Winters' exploits overseas, and I think this map is a helpful foundation in understanding the scope of his travels and travails between 1943 and 1945. For all intents and purposes, he and his men are stationed and or fight their way through six different countries throughout some of the most tedious campaigns of the Second World War, whether we are talking about their training in England and the build-up to D-Day, the fight for France itself, the, the fateful encounter that they had in Holland in autumn of 1944, uh, the surprise of the Ardennes campaign in the winter of 1944 and 1945, and then finally, the, the final stages toward victory in Europe in the spring 
1945. We are going to be exploring this and much, much more. But really, our story begins in this place, Asheville, North Carolina. Winters enlisted into the peacetime army in the months preceding the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, He graduated from Franklin and Marshall College in the fateful year of, of 1941, and he really had two options before him. Uh, One is that he could await for the mandatory draft conscription to pick his number, and he would have to do a full year in the armed forces. Uh, Or he could enlist ahead of time and avoid the draft and in many ways uh, work to his own schedule and ambitions uh, rather than the dictates of Uncle Sam. And so after enlisting, he finds himself at Camp Croft in South Carolina, which is not too far away from Asheville. And Asheville, which we can see here in the background, is where Winters would spend uh, some of his precious spare time. And while he was staying in Asheville on one such occasion, he struck up a rather informal friendship that would blossom into something much, much more with a young local woman by the name of Dieta Alman. Over the course of time, they would become pen pals. And while Winters was stationed in Asheville, uh, they would uh, ride around the Biltmore estate on horseback, as we can see here. And in fact, the two of them were horseback riding on that estate on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese, in fact, did bomb Pearl Harbor. Uh, And so over the course of the next four years, the written friendship that these two individuals had helped them through some exceedingly difficult times in which they had to confront the most trying circumstances of their lives. And I think all in all, what our book underscores is the value of friendship and also the power of the written word. Indeed, uh, letter writing is a bit of a lost art form, but this shows us, this correspondence shows us the value that it can have, especially in these times of hardship and great demand. Uh, And so going from that point forward, Winters, he, even though he is synonymous with the airborne today, Uh, That is not exactly what he initially had in mind. Uh, When he enlisted, he found himself with a bunkmate by the name of Tresta Trenta, who Dick referred to simply as Trent. And Trenta uh, lived only a few dozen blocks away from Winters in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And uh, it, it took them having to move 500 miles away Uh, in the South for them to become friends. Uh, And at left, we can see Winters' identification card, which you can find in the Gettysburg Museum of History. And uh, down at the bottom, you can note how every time he was promoted, he would cross out his old rank and write in a new one. And uh, sure enough, uh, he went through this amazing Uh, progression through the ranks, signs up as a private in 1941, and by the time he comes home around Christmas time, 1945, he is a major. So going from private to major over the course of four years is something quite astounding indeed. Um, But it was Tresta Trenta who planted this idea of joining the Airborne into Winters' head. And as Winters wrote on January 22nd, 1942, he noted, Trent's dug up that old desire of his to be a member of the parachute troops. I've been telling him he's nuts, for that's a suicide outfit. And this is the irony of ironies, considering the very vaunted future that Winters will have in such a suicide outfit. This ambition to reach the pinnacle of his abilities, to constantly uh, pressure himself, uh, to show that he was made of the the utmost physical strength, ultimately brought him to this location, Camp Tokoa, located in Georgia. 
uh, by the time we get to 1942. And part of the daily ritual of men who were within this regiment training here uh, was uh, climbing the six mile round trip of the mountain that we see here in the background that was known as Kurahi, which loomed over the camp. Uh, this mountain would take on a sublime, uh, symbolic significance uh, as the regiment and as the division formed an identity. And as Winters later attested, he noted to Dieta, Kurahi is our motto, our battle cry. It's taken from the mountain Kurahi at Tekoa, Georgia. That one three miles, three miles high, rising at 1,200 feet that we used to run up. The record was 42 minutes. I made it in 44 one day. I am strictly no runner, though. Just did it by plugging along. When I hit Europe in my travels, you'll have a letter from each country the 506 takes and a souvenir. And that includes Berlin and Tokyo, if I must do it myself. In this, we can recognize this supreme level of confidence that winners evokes in his correspondence. And in addition to the tough physical training, like what we see in the photograph on the right, he was also preparing himself intellectually, including through the book that we see on the left, which is called Infantry in Battle. This is Winters' original copy. And as many other people went on leave, as they took trips on weekends, he would often stay behind in the barracks reading this book, absorbing these principles, making notes in the margins. And I think we could make the argument that this book is truly foundational for some of his future exploits on the battlefields of Europe. Uh, before he does depart for overseas, he does on occasion have the opportunity to go back home. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, he lives in the heart of Pennsylvania Dutch country. He lived in a number of different homesteads uh, throughout his early years, uh, but during his boyhood, uh, his family settled into the dwelling that we see on the right, which is located in Lancaster. Uh, and on the right, we can even see a before and after, and the photograph on top uh, even shows Dieta and one of her friends coming to visit Dick Winner's father in Lancaster. And so here too, we can very much get the sense uh, that they are forming a, a devout friendship, and it's one that would last throughout the Second World War. When the 101st Airborne Division relocates to Great Britain in September of 1943, the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment eventually settles into the, the quaint little English countryside village that we see here that is known as Aldborn. And over the course of, over the next half year, these paratroopers within this regiment would use this village as a staging area, a training area, a mobilization depot, a place where they would continue to form themselves as would-be combatants. And while Winters resided here, he lived not in a barracks with fellow officers, uh, but in a general store of sorts that was owned uh, within the town by the couple that we see at right, whose names were Francis and Louis May Barnes. Winters developed quite a degree of affection for them as well. He even referred to Mrs. Barnes as Mother Barnes. They were his uh, parents far away from home, if you will. And much of the correspondence and the newspaper clippings and the Christmas card and the book that we see here were kept or given to Winters while he was residing in Aldborn with this English couple who had, in fact, uh, lost their son in the Royal Air Force at an earlier stage in the war. In March of 1944, uh, Winters was a participant in what was known as the Churchill Drop, and uh, one of the Stars and Stripes articles that we see here in the background documents that event, and uh, this was a vast demonstration of airborne might that was held for not only Winston Churchill, but Dwight Eisenhower and other members 
of the top brass. The uniform that Winters wore on that blustery March day can likewise be seen in the Gettysburg Museum of History. And uh, the original photograph of him wearing it, as well as what it looks like today, can be seen here in the lower left. Uh, and so uh, a very durable uniform, if you will, uh, and or at Winters had the good sense of taking good care of it as a memento of his service. Now, not everything is uh, perfect or without drama while Winters is overseas, because over time, he will develop this rather unhealthy rivalry with his company commander, whose name is Herbert Sobel. Um, and there are many opinions about Herbert Sobel. Uh, some of the men thought he was uh, tyrannical, that he was egotistical. Others are of the mind that his hard-nosed demeanor and his harsh sense of leadership prepared the men for many of the challenges that they would confront in the subsequent months and years. But in any case, we can surmise that there was a perhaps a a sense of uh, suspicion or a level of distrust on Sobel's part as he perceived Winters. He perhaps viewed uh, Winters as an internal threat, a competitor, someone who was perhaps vying for his job, and perhaps as a consequence, uh, Sobel tried to do away with Winters, and he brought up this rather trivial charge that Winters had been late for a latrine inspection in October of 1943. Uh, and eventually, Winters was brought up on charges for this incredibly small infraction. And Sobel essentially tells him, you can either take a form of punishment that I will administer, or if you wish to petition against my accusation, uh, you can opt for a court-martial. And knowing that he had done nothing wrong, Winters opts for a court-martial, trying to uh, reverse the trap on Sobel, if you will. And the document that we see here on the right shows Winters' uh, handwriting and signature at the bottom saying that he requests a trial by court-martial. Um, these charges were eventually dropped. Uh, Sobel is eventually rotated out of the unit. It was something that the commanders within the regiment wanted to put behind them, uh, but it just goes to underscore a very challenging moment of internal friction uh, that Winters had to confront within his first month or so of being stationed in England. All the while, as we consider Dieta's role in the conflict, uh, she and her three brothers ultimately joined the United States Navy. And uh, Winters was very pleased about this when he heard that his pen pal was to join the armed forces. And he wrote to her on March 20th, 1944, there should be a lot of smart modern things to say upon finding out you've joined the waves. And the waves was the female contingent within the United States Navy at that time. And he goes on to say, but all I can say is what I feel. You've got what it takes. Congratulations, rookie. And from there on, winners would often try to provide professional input and perspective that would help the edit navigate the realm of the United States military. One of Winters' most poignant letters to Dieta was written on June 2nd, 1944, a mere four days before the invasion of Normandy. And this is about as sentimental as his correspondence gets. And he wrote to her, I'll tell you what, every night it taps, I'll meet you at the North Star. The old North Star is a soldier's guiding light when he's lost, alone and feeling mighty funny in the pit of his stomach. That's when he feels good, when he can look up and know that there's somebody else looking up there also. These sort of sentiments were perhaps in Winter's mind as he was possibly becoming nostalgic about home and friends and family because he was going to need as much luck as possible uh, a mere four days later as he and, other, and another 13,000 Allied paratroopers and glider men 
would uh, descend into the Normandy countryside in the dead of night on June 6th, 1944. Uh, this painting that we see on the screen reveals the intensity of the landing. Uh, for any of you viewing who have perhaps gone skydiving, that in and of itself can be a very scary proposition. But when you have 100 pounds of gear strapped onto you, you're jumping at only a few hundred feet. Uh, an angry enemy is shooting at you. Many of the fields below your plane have been flooded by an enemy who is trying to drown you when you land. And it's pitch black. Uh, that, that is a whole other proposition entirely. Uh, and Winters was in the thick of it. Uh, and it didn't start off in too good a fashion for him. Um, and as he later wrote in an in-depth retrospective on D-Day, just about two weeks after, he wrote part of this almost as if it was in real time. Uh, and, and he remarked in this regard, looking back, it's 1.10, red light, 10 minutes out, all's quiet. Ah, there's some anti-aircraft fire, blue, green, red tracers coming up to meet us. Gee, it seems to come low. They're pretty wild with it. There, it looks like they might have hit one of our planes. Look out, they're after us now. I think accounts like this speak to the value of his wartime letters and his correspondence because there's a level of immediacy to it that cannot be found in post-war books and even his memoirs written some 60 years later. Uh, this is the value of going back and looking at the primary source in the moment. And he goes on to write about the incredibly tense opening moments of the Normandy invasion. There are paratroopers who have been uh, misdropped all over the place. There's uh, confusion. Uh, it's just utter chaos. And one thing that disturbed winners perhaps most was the, the reverberations of the church bells from San Mary Glees, this community of which Gettysburg is the sister town in which uh, Winters landed right outside of, on the outskirts on D-Day. And as he later wrote, those church bells weren't tolling a request for us to come to church, but an alarm to all the countryside that we'd arrived. What followed, of course, is history, but it sure gave me a funny feeling. Machine gun fire and rifle fire didn't scare me, but those bells, being all alone with only a knife, gave me the feeling of being hunted down by a pack of wolves. And I think that is about as a lively and emotional account of what D-Day was like for those landing in these earliest moments of it. In the opening phases of the invasion, and as uh, little groups of paratroopers were uh, wandering about trying to form into these impromptu units, uh, find their, their rendezvous points, determine their objectives. Uh, in the morning of June 6, later on, as the sun was coming up, um, Winters and his men are ordered to attack an enemy emplacement of four 105 millimeter guns, which are within firing range of Utah Beach, where the 4th Infantry Division amphibious troops would be landing that morning. Uh, Winters devises a very methodical approach to this assault. And as we can get a sense of from these graphics and this image in the background, uh, he seizes the guns in domino fashion, uh, one by one. These cannon were uh, burrowed into a very thick hedgerow uh, located at this location known as Braycourt Manor. Uh, this was one of the sublime moments of Winters' heroism, and uh, he would eventually receive major recognition for that, as we will discover here shortly. Uh, this is where uh, my story becomes a little bit personal as it's associated with Winters, because among the troops landing on Utah Beach that morning was my very own grandfather. And it begs the question, 
uh, did Winters and his men possibly spare my grandfather's life and those of some of his comrades? Uh, and so it's these interesting sort of speculative guessing games uh, that can sometimes bring history to life in a very real way. In the aftermath of this assault on Braycourt Manor, within his so-called D-Day diary, uh, Winters drew uh, this map showing the placement of his men, how they uh, endeavored to take these positions, and it adds just a, another layer of context to this already rich written account. Uh, among the personal items uh, that winners carried in the Normandy campaign or throughout the war, we can see right here, uh, and they include the binoculars that we see on the left. Uh, he wrote his name on a piece of medical tape and plastered that to the top of the leather field glasses case. And uh, he also painted the emblem uh, for his second battalion here on the front of the leather case. Uh, Winters had two sidearms, Colt 1911 model, like the one we see uh, here in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, that is not the one that he carried with him on D-Day. Um, for those who have seen or the, the miniseries Band of Brothers or read the book upon which it is based, um, you'll know that Winters lost pretty much everything but his knife that was affixed to his boot as a result of the prop blast when he exited his airplane on D-Day. Um, this one was left behind in England. This was his backup, and this is the one that he would carry with him throughout the remainder of the war as a consequence. Uh, the photograph that we see in the lower right is perhaps the best known image of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment during the war. And uh, that was taken in another crossroads community nearby called Saint Marie Dumont. Uh, and that is the image that was actually on the first edition cover of Band of Brothers when it was released in 1992. Despite Winters' D-Day heroics and those of his men, the fight for France is far from over. And uh, a mere uh, a week or two uh, after uh, D-Day had commenced, the 101st Airborne Division sets its sights on the community of Carentan. And Carentan was another uh, a vital location that was necessary to take over in order to link up the American beachheads of Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. And here too, uh, winners went above and beyond the call of duty as his hometown newspaper later reflected, as we can see here. And the Lancaster New Era wrote on June 27th, 1944, he went into the front lines when the SS troops counterattacked Carentan the night of June 12th and the morning of June 13th. He was commanded by his CO, the dispatch stated, who said it was Lieutenant Winter's personal bravery and battle knowledge that held a crucial position when the going was really tough. And uh, for all of these uh, instances of heroics, uh, Winters uh, attains a number of things formal and informal, some of which include these captured Fallschirmjäger gloves. Uh, the Fallschirmjäger were the equivalent of the American paratroopers. These were German airborne troops. And um, sometime uh, during the fighting here in Normandy, Winters was able to procure these leather gloves off of a German prisoner of war. And in the photograph on the right, we can see many decades later, uh, winners uh, proudly sporting uh, those same leather gloves that had become a war trophy. Uh, something uh, really compelling there. And uh, as a result of these heroics, on the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, no less, on July 2nd, 1944, uh, Winners was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross uh, by Omar Bradley. Uh, and the photograph that we see here in the background um, is a very rare one that we've included in our book. Uh, and it shows a, a number of really notable individuals. Um, on the far left is General Maxwell Taylor, commander of the 101st Airborne Division. On the stage with the three stars on his helmet, we see Omar Bradley. And circled in yellow, we can see uh, Dick Winters himself. Um, on that very same day, 
he wrote a letter to Dieta, and he noted, your prayers for my safety certainly helped a lot, more than you know. I don't know what else could pull a fellow through. Even though Winters was very confident of his abilities as the war dragged on, uh, in, in some cases he developed a sense of fatalism. He perhaps thought that he was not going to survive the war, and that was a sentiment that would, would, would grow more intense as the war progressed. The division received about a two-month break throughout the summer of 1944, but then in September they are called into action once again uh, with the overly optimistic mission that would be codenamed Operation Market Garden. Uh, this was the hope of multiple Allied airborne divisions uh, parachuting into Nazi-occupied Holland, uh, capturing a number of bridges spanning the Rhine River and allowing those to batter their way into the heart of Nazi Germany. Uh, the success of these various objectives and missions was predicated entirely upon time and logistics, all of which would ultimately break down in the process, uh, leading to catastrophic failure. Uh, and um, earlier on, you know, Winters and his men were uh, assigned to capture a bridge spanning one of the canals in the vicinity. And as we can see in this top photograph, the Germans uh, blew it up when the Americans were within mere feet of capturing it, and Winters was there when that explosion occurred. He had also started to develop, the, started to develop a good sense of survival instincts. Uh, he carried a rifle like his men. He didn't simply carry around a sidearm by itself. Um, he would turn up the collars of his jacket so German snipers couldn't see his rank. He would tuck his binoculars down into his jacket, binoculars being another sign of officer status. And rather than carrying a map case, he had a custom zipper pocket sewn into the back of his M1943 uniform jacket that we can see here. Um, and so in his mind, um, not standing out in a crowd, blending in with his enlisted men uh, was perhaps a good means of survival. Uh, this photograph that we see in the background is a, a good visual representation of the sort of environment that the men of the 101st would fight through over the next two months in the autumn of 1944. But perhaps the best known incident, uh, the one that really stood out in Winters' mind, uh, were, were the actions of October 5th, 1944. Uh, when he and a, a small cluster of his men were within arm's length of two German companies as uh, the various forces were navigating their way uh, through the, the, the dikes and trenches and meadows of waterlogged Holland. And ultimately, Winters determined that the only way that their survival could perhaps be ensured uh, was to launch a bayonet charge uh, against the enemy. And here, too, perhaps another uh, parallel to Joshua Chamberlain, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. When you have nowhere else to go, perhaps the only way to go is forward with your bayonets fixed. Uh, and so Winters jumps out ahead of his men. They cannot keep up with him. Uh, he runs up atop one of these dikes, and later on, he offers this testimony as to what occurred next. He notes, in jumping up on the dike, there's this young German soldier right across the road from me. He's directly on the other side of that road from me, about two steps away, because it was just a narrow dirt road coming up from the river. I came up directly across from him, eyeball to eyeball, and he was just as shocked as could be. I leveled off at him. The thing I can never forget was that he smiled. And as he smiled, I shot him. This was a moment seared into Winter's memory. The, the image of that young enemy sentinel, who wasn't doing a very good job, by the way, it was something that Winters could never quite forget. And this is a moment that's depicted in a very evocative fashion 
in the miniseries. The uniform that he was wearing, uh, possibly during this encounter, the uniform that he was uh, wearing in Holland, we can see at left in this very famous photograph of uh, Winter standing in front of what's known as the Skunderlocht Arch. And that uniform as well can be seen in the Gettysburg Museum of History. So it's a, a real treasure trove of a winner's items, real witnesses to history, I think we could say. Once again, after these hard months of uh, fighting on the line, that 101st Division is once again uh, pulled back into France, in Reims specifically. And in mid-December of 1944, uh, winners took the opportunity to take a short leave to Paris. And here in the background is another rare photograph, and we can see uh, winners standing here in front of the Arc de Triomphe, uh, among uh, many other uh, American officers. And uh, winners did what many people do when they go to Paris. Uh, he went sightseeing. He got a tour booklet. He got a tour map. He saw museums. He saw memorials. He saw artwork. Um, but above all else, he just simply wanted some rest. And it's a good thing that he did go to get rest here at this moment, because he wasn't soon to get any thereafter in the weeks to come. The program booklet that we see in the upper right advertises the Champagne Bowl, which was to take place on Christmas Day between uh, two different uh, regiments within the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, but sadly, this would be a football game that would not take place because only about a week beforehand, uh, dozens of German divisions uh, break through the weakly defended sector uh, in uh, Belgium and Luxembourg known as the Ardennes. And they create a bulge that is several dozen miles deep within the American defenses. Hence, the Battle of the Bulge commences. Uh, winners and his men are mobilized to respond to this threat. They are largely unprepared. Many of them do not have the proper winter clothing. There seem to be shortages of everything. And on top of that, it was one of the worst and most miserable European winters in well over a half a century. And in these conditions, the paratroopers, as well as all the other American outfits that fought in this campaign that would include over a million combatants, uh, they had to confront Mother Nature as well as the enemy. Frostbite, trench foot, material shortages, disillusionment uh, happening in this uh, foggy, snowy aura were, were things that could eat away at the effectiveness of a fighting unit as uh, easily as a sudden enemy onslaught. Uh, these were the things that winners had to contend with. And uh, this painting shows this uh, sort of paternalistic uh, affection and efficiency that he would take in regard to his men. And uh, after he survives the Battle of the Bulge, uh, this iconic clash at Bastogne, uh, subsequent fights outside of Foy and other crossroads communities. Uh, his correspondence to Dieta most definitely takes a turn toward darkness. And he wrote to her in January 1945, since I am in the army, I daydream of fights, fighting Jerry's, outmaneuvering, outthinking, outshooting, and outfighting them. They're tense, cruel, hard, and bitter. They consist of about 80% of my dreams, but they pay off. You'd be surprised. Sometimes when you dream over and over a problem, you get a solution. This account is, is exceedingly dark. Uh, it is morose. But here at the end, it, it reveals something significant about winners, and that is the fact that no matter the level of hardship that he was enduring, he always tried to find a silver lining. How can I make the most out of this dreadful situation? And here he's making the argument that his nightmares sometimes resulted in solutions to the many sorts of problems that he was confronting. So I think in many ways, this is quite revealing. 
uh, throughout the rest of the winter and going into the spring of 1945, the division daily inches its way closer to the heart of the Third Reich. And by May of 1945, uh, Winters and his men have the great good fortune of celebrating Victory in Europe Day at none other than Berchtesgaden, which was a symbolic home of Nazism uh, located in the shadow of the Alps, as we see here. And this is just a wonderfully iconic photograph of Winters and his fellow officers uh, reveling in the, the victory and the gratitude of the moment. Uh, many of these men, winners included, went to the various homes of Nazi leaders and hotels and offices and barracks, and they sought souvenirs. And uh, many men within the 101st uh, came home with pieces of Adolf Hitler's silverware, uh, likewise, some of which can be seen in the museum, and we can see one small example of that here in the lower right-hand corner. Something else that is very revealing, though, about Winters is uh, something that he writes home to Dieta uh, about a month after the war in Europe comes to an end, because she was very surprised to learn that Winters was actually petitioning to go fight in the war in the Pacific against the Japanese, which was still ongoing at that time. And he writes to her, how can I sit back and see others take out men and get them killed because they don't know? They don't have it. Maybe I'll get hurt or killed for my trouble, but so what if I can make it possible for many others to go home? Their mothers want them too, the same as me. So what else can I do and still hold my own self-respect as an officer and a man? This paragraph, perhaps more than any other, highlights Winters' sense of leadership, uh, his selflessness. Uh, he is willing to travel to the other side of the globe, lead men in combat, even though he's earned the right to go home, uh, simply because he knows he has combat experience. He knows that is something to value, and he wants to put it to good use in the hope that other men might be able to go home to their mothers too, as a result. Uh, it's an incredibly compelling and insightful uh, glimpse uh, into his mind as a leader in the latter stages of the war. One of the really surprising things I learned about Winters is that he had a sense of humor. And his sense of humor was perhaps most representative in, in what he said and how he poked fun of other branches of the military and other segments of the United States Army. And really the only uh, other group uh, within the military that uh, Winters thought were on an equal parring uh, to the paratrooper was the Marine Corps. And he said, the Marine Doughboy, he's okay. The rest, I can't understand. He said of service of supply, uh, people working in almost a quartermaster capacity, he said of them, they wear the uniform and draw the pay, but that's it. They just don't know the score. They can't even walk or act like a soldier. Of the U.S. Army Air Forces, he had this to say, I spent the evening in London, the most lonesome night I've had in years. All Air Corps men and not a man or soldier in the bunch. I couldn't talk to any of them. They're boys, kids, no depth. And he uh, reserved perhaps uh, his, his greatest degree of cynicism against the United States Navy. And of course, he was writing these letters to somebody who was in the Navy. Uh, and so uh, this perhaps makes sense. Uh, and he wrote to Dieta, now that you're in the ferry, now that you're going in the Navy, you're just another member of the ferry boat command. Oof says, that's something I guess you miss in the Navy. I mean, the soldiering part. He goes on, maybe I'm a victim of propaganda, but what's the difference between a sailor and a 4F? In other words, someone who is uh, physically ineligible for military service. Uh, and then he finally concludes, why as a soldier, I've seen more of the sea than you ever have or ever will. You're just a land-bound, dry dock, saltless salt. And that may seem overly harsh to somebody that he's writing to who is ostensibly his girlfriend, someone of potential romantic interest. 
but I fully suspect that Dieta uh, was able to deliver as good as she got, and uh, she was able to uh, have very good rebuttals to these uh, one-liners that Winters was delivering to her. But in all seriousness, in their correspondence, you truly get a sense of the meaning of their friendship. And this is best represented in what Winters writes uh, immediately after the war comes to a conclusion. And he writes to her, I'll never forget your one letter saying, and when you're in a tight spot, remember you've got to come back. So by gosh, what happened in the biggest and toughest fight I was ever in? I'm so pooped, I can hardly walk after three nights and four days of no rest. And I am running through an actual hail of bullets, two or three times an hour. And I'm not kidding, it was a hail. This one time I am halfway through and a machine gun opens up on me. Down I go. And he thinks he has me. I am playing dead. And what do I do? I think, yep, she said, I've got to come through. And here I am today, lucky fellow. And so it was perhaps knowing that it was somebody back at home who was caring for him and rooting for him that gave him that additional boost of energy and self-confidence that he needed in order to get through these exceedingly difficult times. When the war comes to an end, Dick and Dieta meet only once more, and then they lose touch with one another for half a century. After the book Band of Brothers comes out in 1992, Dick eventually received a rather cryptic phone call in which the voice on the other line asked if this was Dick Winters who was featured in Band of Brothers. And when he answered in the affirmative, he found out that the voice on the other line was Dieta's daughter. And so uh, the daughter and Dieta, they had heard or read about Dick, and they sought to reunite with him. Uh, and so they start phoning each other. They start writing to each other. And at this time, Dieta says to Dick, I still have all of your letters that you wrote to me during the war. Would you like them back? And Dick said, oh, that would be wonderful. And so Dieta mails them back. Dick and his wife, Ethel, transcribed them. And then in May of 1996, for Dieta's birthday, uh, Dick and his wife went to visit her and her family in Wilmington, North Carolina. And he presented back to her a transcripted copy of the letters that he wrote to her during the war. Uh, and so it's this wonderful story of friendship that meant so much, but then it lapsed for a half a century, and then here they were reunited uh, in the 1990s. Uh, sadly, Dieta passed away in early 2001, and she never got to see the fame and the celebrity uh, that her former beau would thereafter have as a result of that iconic HBO miniseries, Band of Brothers, in which winners is portrayed by actor Damian Lewis, who we see with winners at his home office here in the upper middle. Uh, thereafter, uh, winners' signature and memorabilia associated with him became a very valuable commodity among World War II collectors. Uh, we can see on the left a helmet that Winters signed with his mantra, hang tough, and on the right is the helmet that actor Damian Lewis wore during the filming of Band of Brothers that he later presented to Dick Winters. Uh, it was around this same time and in the years preceding uh, that Winters was very active on the speaking circuit. He went to museums, military academies, and even Eisenhower National Historic Site in Gettysburg, where the photo at the bottom, uh, taken circa 1998 or 2000, uh, shows Winters interacting uh, with uh, airborne reenactors on the back lawn of uh, Dwight Eisenhower's farm. And uh, uh, he's holding a brass knuckle knife in his hand, perhaps showing the reenactors how to properly use it. And so uh, here too, once again, uh, is another Adams County connection in regard to Dick Winter's story. As we begin to wrap up, 
we reflect upon uh, some of uh, Dick's perhaps most compelling words. Uh, and we conclude the book with these thoughts because um, in his final years, uh, Dick was asked by one interviewer what advice he had for young people, uh, perhaps uh, young people who were thinking of joining the military themselves. And uh, Winters said this, I have one message to all, hang tough, do your best every day. You don't have to know all the answers, no way. Don't expect that of yourself. Just do your best. Satisfy yourself so at the end of the day, you can look in the mirror after you've brushed your teeth and say honestly to yourself, today I did my best. If you do that, everything is going to be okay. And indeed, these are wise words from a life well lived. And even if you have not served in the military, even if you have not put yourself in harm's way, as most of us have not, you can still live by this mantra. You can try to do your best every day. You can try to make an impact on society. You can try to be a good citizen. And as long as you do that every day, as long as you attempt to be a good person, uh, you are certainly living up to the ideals that Dick Winters lived by. These are important thoughts to keep in mind as the last of the World War II generation is currently departing us. And I certainly hope this presentation has offered some good food for thought. You can read uh, Dick Winters' wartime correspondence in its entirety in our book that I co-authored with Eric Dorr, once again entitled Hang Tough, The World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters. I have also written a book called Dispatches of D-Day, which is a newspaper history of the Normandy invasion. And as a follow-up to Hang Tough, uh, Eric and I teamed up once more for the book entitled Fierce Valor, The True Story of Ronald Spears and His Band of Brothers. If you're looking for some insightful reads on the Second World War, I kindly submit these titles to you for your consideration. But uh, I thank you so much for tuning in to my presentation. And I once again thank the Adams County Historical Society for inviting me to speak. Thanks again.